So I'm writing a novel is the show where you join me, Oliver Brackenbury, on the journey of writing my next novel from first ideas all the way to publication and promotion. In this one man reality show, I'll share with you my ever evolving thoughts and feelings on how I write, being a writer and everything that entails at each stage of the process. I'll also answer listener questions and sometimes interview special guests. If you're the kind of person who likes to learn how things are made and get to know the people making them, then this is the show for you. Last time I talked about my world building approach for the City of Thieves in which at least four stories of my novel are going to take place. And I'm really glad I did that. I'm really glad I did that thing in the episode where I forced myself to name the bloody city before I stopped recording, if only because it helped me figure out the name of the story I'm going to be talking about with you today, Kinship in Khartoum. That name is a riff on a story which, even if you haven't read it, you've probably heard it mentioned quite a bit in the last few episodes of this show. Or maybe this is your first episode, in which case, welcome! I'm my, my name is Oliver, I'm writing a sword and sorcery novel and I'm telling you all about it. Anyway, that story is Ill Met in Lankmar, written by Fritz Leiber, his sort of back-filling origin story for the meeting of his big guy, little guy thief team, Baffert and Grey Mouser. Kinship in Khartoum is my intentionally written first at the start <laughs> a meeting story for my character Vo and her new best friend, because uh, we've had Vo already for the first act of the novel here in a few stories, her new best friend, Tiravam. I talk about the design of Tiravam in detail two episodes back in episode 26, making a new best friend. But you don't have to have listened to that to be able to follow today's episode. With this story, am I looking to just do like a pastiche, a photocopy more or less, of the original tale, Ilmet and Lankmar? No. Am I inspired by it and maybe lifting one or two small little moves from that story? Yes. <laughs> all right, let's get into the details of what that all means. Right off the bat, I'll tell you that this is definitely an episode where I'm telling you how a story was figured out in the order that makes sense for the telling not quite the order it actually happened. Once again, I'm reminded of that William Gibson tweet about how the longer his writing career goes on, the more he focuses on the order of information in his novels, from a single sentence to the whole book, and how that creates meaning. So I'm going to start with a problem I faced, which should have been the first thing I figured out. I kind of thought I had figured it out. But uh, yeah, it actually wound up being one of the last decisions I made with this story. See, in the first act of the novel, I had decided to do a third person limited perspective, looking over the shoulder, you know, the point of view and occasionally into the thoughts of a single person that Vo, you know, passed through their life. You know, so like they're the protagonist technically, but like my novel's protagonist uh, is passing through their life in each of the stories in the first act. Now we're entering act two, part one, there's two halves, and we have a new like co-protagonist with Tiravam, and they're going to be around for more than one story. So what am I going to do? Earlier, when I did my kind of broad outlining for the whole act and was making decisions about stuff like this, I kind of figured for, you know, this Liber-esque section, I would do something kind of like Liber, who freely head hopped across all characters in his stories, not just uh, the two main people, and occasionally would sort of turn to the camera and talk to you. It was almost some sort of hybrid of limited third person and omniscient perspectives. But after I did that overall act two outlining and then deep character breakdown for Tiravam and figuring out what I needed to figure out for the city that eventually was named Khartoum, and I came to this story, my confidence in that decision had crumbled like a crappy sandcastle in the wind. Feeling a little lost and making some scrabbling notes that didn't really get to a concrete decision, I realized I needed to talk this through with someone else. And lucky me, Oi of the Appendix N Book Club podcast, great podcast, and he was my interview guest a few episodes back. Although again, you don't have to listen to it. <laughs> Just know he's a great guy and he's smart and he reads a lot of genre books. And he listens to this podcast. Hi, Hoy. <laughs> Anyway, Hoy at the end of that interview had kindly offered if I ever wanted to talk through an aspect of the novel that I'm working on with him, I could. So I reached out to him and we had a video call where I talked it through. In short, I was having trouble settling on a perspective to consistently maintain through the four stories that make up this part of the novel, especially one that would kind of feel part of a natural progression from how I handled it in the first part to how I handled it in the back end of Act 2 and then Act 3. The only thing I knew for sure, and this came out of actually first bringing up uh, a little bit on the Whetstone Discord and chatting with some people there, was that I wanted a logical progression and that because in the first act Vo is kind of at a distance, it made sense to me to just be getting closer and closer and closer to Vo and her thoughts and actions and focusing on her as the novel progressed. 
As one person wisely put it on the Discord, and person, if you're listening, I'm sorry, it's been weeks, I can't remember now who exactly said it, but they made a great point that if I were to move the perspective closer to Vo, I couldn't really go backwards. I couldn't go back to looking at her from afar after, say, spending some time right, you know, first person in her head hearing her thoughts and having her tell you the story. It would just be too jarring for most readers. Or at least that was the consensus on the Discord, and I'm inclined to agree. Hoy and I talked quite a bit and wound up covering more than what I had called to ask him about, which is great. He gave me all kinds of amazing feedback and, and, and ideas and stuff. But yeah, basically he said the way he saw it was that Vo is bigger than life in Act 1 by way of how the POV is handled there. You know, she is this big figure coming through other people's lives and making changes in them and so on and then going off to the next adventure. But in the first half of Act 2... She's getting into thief hijinks with her new best friend, and thief hijinks generally means scheming, which means wanting to have some idea of what the character is thinking a lot more up close than, you know, seeing someone else observing them, which is what we've had with Vo in the first act. And so after a bit more chatter along those lines, we agreed that I want to do third person limited over both Vo and Tiravam's shoulders, head hopping between them, but not going full omniscient on the whole world, especially because that is something I'm planning to do in the back end of Act 2, which I'll talk more about when we get to there. Okay, I'm not going to spend that long on every little detail of this outline, but the POV thing was really holding me up, so I thought I should get into the details of how that happened. Right then, on to the actual beginnings of my notes for this, which was me writing down, whatever the plot, this is the story of Vo and Tiravan becoming not only best friends, but bound to each other. That's what this is about. I figured at this point they've both been in the city, Khartoum, which uh, was unnamed when I was doing this outline, so I'm probably just going to keep saying the city. Uh, but yeah, they've both been in the city for a little while, maybe a month, and maybe they have romantic partners, uh, or at least people they fool around with. Vo has the thief that she's brought with her from the very end of Act 1 in the story Disgrace the Stone, and Tiravem has perhaps brought a lower caste person from her home. Quick sidebar, I know I've defined Tiravem as being by gender, which means sometimes they identify as male, sometimes as female, but not along a spectrum, that would be gender fluid. However, in my mind, I definitely see them as being uh, AFAB assigned female at birth, uh, sort of, you know, would pass as just like a cis female person. And so I have a tendency to refer to them as her. Haven't made up my mind yet about how I'm going to handle this in the book. Something to think about later. Okay, back to the main outline. I'm thinking perhaps both Vo and Tiravem are starting to chafe in these relationships already, even though it's been like a month, right? But feel obligated to stay in them, and it takes bonding with each other to find someone they can talk it through with. Then they can help free each other from these relationships. Okay, awesome. That felt like a story. So then I thought, okay, let's do a quick review, which I will not do here, but I made a long list of what I really wanted to establish in this. Things like how Vo has changed and what the setting is and who Tiravam is. Sometimes when writing this down, I would put page references to when I'd already written these things down earlier in my notebook, but other times I would copy them out again, often tweaking them a little bit in doing so. This is a way of trying to really drive it into my head because there's so much to keep track of in a story, particularly a story that's kind of almost like a new origin story. This is almost like a chapter one for the novel again, right? And especially when you have all these things to remember in the story, in the novel, in your life. I really think there's no shame in writing things down more than once in more than one place to help you keep track of it all. So after getting down what I felt was the core of the story in my list of things that I wanted to make sure I established and introduced in that story, I kind of sat down for a second and thought, ah, who am I fooling? You know, I'm putting this off because I'm afraid it will influence me to the point of just making a bad copy. But I should really reread Ilmet and Lankmar and make study notes while I do so. You know, as I say, I'm not looking to copy or do a pastiche or whatever. I want to do my own thing, building on the past, pushing it through the copper noodle extruder of my mind slash lived experiences. This reminds me of one of the books I'm reading right now, The Adventures of Alex by Joanna Russ. Alex is a thief, a fantasy thief, sword and sorcery thief, uh, often referred to as a picklock, which I like, that even had an affair with Liber's character, Fafford. And Alex gets a mention in the Two Best Thieves in Lankmar, one of you know, Liber's Lankmar tales. But trust me, you would never mistake Alex's adventures for bad photocopies of Fafford and Grey Master tales or Liber's voice when writing them. Believe me, you know Joanna Russ when you see her on the page. Hopefully I can achieve something similar in that regard. Some people rag on Ilmet. Uh, I like it, even as a sort of 
backstory backfill. I ended up taking about three and a half pages of notes covering the basics of trying to nail down like, you know, what's the point of view? I always like to write the opening sentence down too. It's I think that's very important in a story. I'm hardly alone in that. Elements of style, like how he handles fight scenes. I was thinking about some stuff Howard Andrew Jones taught in his heroic fantasy course about, you know, when you want to give a lot of detail when you don't. And so I paid attention to when Liber did and didn't do that. And a whole bunch of other stuff, including plot twists and turns and so on and so forth. For you, I'm going to share very quickly six things that I took away from it that really felt like, okay, I want to have these in mind while I'm writing my story. You see, Fafford and Grey Mouser both have their own romantic partners that they have brought with them from their own individual origin stories, one of which was a repurposed fantasy story he'd already written about somebody else, I guess, and the other one being an original written as part of this whole backfill origin thing that Liber was set upon doing when he decided he wanted to take all of his Fafford and Grey Mouser stories he'd already written and try and stitch them together into a grand saga. And I found it deeply charming in Ill Met when it's revealed how much both Fafford and Grey Mouser want their respective romantic partners to like Fafford or Grey Mouser. I think we've all been there when we've had a new partner and we want them to get along with our friends and vice versa. I also liked what's described as kind of a boyishness that they bring out in each other. They become kind of more, you know, they're not exactly old in the story, I would hazard a guess. They're in their early 20s. I can't remember if it's actually put down, but anyway, whatever. Let's say they're in their early to mid 20s. And they make each other feel even younger, like two kids who've met on the schoolyard. I think that's wonderful. And I want to have something like that for Vo and Teravan for sure. Then there was a line that I thought really summed up an element I wanted to have with my characters where Grey Master chastises Fafford because they're going to get disguised to pull off a scheme, essentially. And he has some reservations. And Grey Master is like, aren't you willing to make the least sacrifice for art's sake? I love the idea of the arts being deeply important to at least one, if not both, of my own characters. With Liber, it was definitely coming out of his theater and cinema background and his father's background. Here, I went with writing with Tara Vem. I want her to be a amateur playwright and for that to infect how she goes about things. I think it'll spark nicely too, coming off of Vo having grown up with storytelling being a very important tradition, uh, certainly in her family, if not also her culture and gives the opportunity to have two different concepts of storytelling spark off each other and their expectations and how it shapes their actions. Not that I plan to have a lot of fourth wall breaking with them being like, what do you think is going to be the second act of our story here? <laughs> as I've mentioned a few times in this podcast already, and as the mighty Michael Curtis mentioned in my interview with him, Liber is a big fan of the hyphenate, of the Homeric epithet, of the wine dark sea, shoulder grabbed, bludgeon menaced, Gosh, it's just fun. Definitely I want to play with that myself. Now, I'd already decided long before I did these study notes that I wanted Vo and Teravam to have differing ideas and approaches to the concept of killing in their adventures, and that these would actually eventually grow to become bigger and bigger and bigger differences until they stop being friends in part because of it. But I still wanted to make a note about when the difference in attitude towards killing that Fafran and Grey Master have, which I believe is articulated differently in an entirely other story, uh, is articulated in this one. After a fight scene which involves some killing, Fafford sees a look of disgust or whatever on Grey Mouser's face and says, killing in a fight isn't murder. And Grey Mouser replies, killing is murder no matter what nice names you give. The final big item from my notes that I'll mention is my list of ways in which I felt the two fellas bonded with each other. The easiest one is drink. Boy, how do they get really drunk in this one? It's actually kind of a plot point at uh, one juncture. More on my own take on that in a minute. Meanwhile, there was also bonding in battle, which, you know, yeah, I totally want to do that. It's fun. It shows different styles and attitudes to killing. Great stuff. Youthfulness. Hell yes. The newfound freedoms and boyishness and so on they bring out in each other. I want to have that with Vo and Tiravim. Arguably the deepest point of bonding between Vaffron and Grey Mouser in this story is the bond of shared tragedy. Because of them, spoiler for a very old story, their partners die. I thought about this and then I was like, mm, you know, I prefer trust and sort of deep pal talks that allow them to help each other extricate themselves from relationships that aren't really great uh, for reasons I'll get into. So, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do the tragedy thing, uh, especially because in Ilmet and Lankmar, the tragedy element ultimately drives Fafran and Grey Master to leave the city at the end of the story to go have some adventures elsewhere, which feels kind of funky if I'm going to be sending up my characters as like, yeah, they're in Khartoum. This is where gonna, they're going to have adventures, buddy. And next adventure, they're not there. <laughs> uh, why did Liber do this? Well, remember, like I said, he's trying to stitch together, or was trying to stitch together all of his stories, and I believe it was because he wanted to get them out of town to be in the story he felt should chronologically take place next. And then I just wrote anything else, and I figured curiosity. You know, I want curiosity to be something that gets these two into hijinks together, and maybe ultimately is their motivation until 
preservation, uh, self-preservation becomes their motivation and once they're in trouble. After I figured out all this, I wrote down in my notes kind of what I like to do every once in a while to make myself stop and reassess. I just wrote SO <laughs> in all caps uh, across two lines. The story is of these two coming together and helping each other ditch relationships that feel like obligations for different reasons with each of them. But what of the actual plot? Like, what are the sequences of events here? Like, what, what's going on? What's happening? My very next note was asking, you know, what if part of their drive to keep staying out, carousing and pursuing adventure and gold is not wanting to go home to their respective partners? And OK, great. I really like that. But Oliver, where are they when they meet? What is happening? Come on, guy. <laughs> I don't want to photocopy Ilmet and Lankmar, so that means they will not be meeting while they are both planning to rob the same thing or people. The classic they met in an inn or tavern or bar or whatever you want to call it has been done to death in fantasy fiction and people's role playing games. That doesn't mean it can't ever be done ever again or that it can't be reinvigorated by some great idea but it did make me less anxious to do such a thing. However, I got an idea from a book I was reading at the same time as I was pondering this. That book is called The Wet and the Dry, A Drinker's Journey by Lawrence Osborne. It's a slim volume in which Lawrence talks about drinking culture and addiction and all that stuff within the contrasting and often overlapping cultures and countries of secular Europe and Muslim Middle East Mediterranean you know, areas. So I found myself wondering what if liquor is haram, uh, that's spelled with two A's, that's when it's forbidden, in my Lankmar in Khartoum? This would make my leads drinking together even more roguish, eliminate the stereotypical fantasy tavern or inn as a setting, inspire me to create all kinds of interesting like speakeasies and other you know forbidden corners where people can drink, and even could add a facet to Tiravans settling down in their final story. Perhaps they get religion or they get the religion, because I don't want it to be monotheistic in this city, uh, the religion that has made this a thing, if only as a way of dealing with their own alcoholism. Boy, am I glad I didn't write a phone book of stuff on the background of the city, leaving some gaps for me to come up with and insert things like this. After deciding this, I made some quick scribbles about like the religion, you know, I just decided right up front I did not want to make it a one-to-one -one analog of uh, Islam, and uh, maybe it could be, uh, I don't know, a highly sexual cult of quote-unquote Aphrodite, uh, maybe that's part of the equation, or perhaps I would have it suggested that dealers of, you know, my fantasy, not weed, uh, over a century ago worked their beliefs about alcohol into the public consciousness so their product would reign supreme, kind of like a lower stakes version of what the Benedict get up to in Dune. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not going to spoil it. But yeah, I like that idea of this church, this this big religion, certainly would have to be the dominant one, if uh, not the only one, in Khartoum. I liked the idea of them using their beliefs as a kind of marketing tool <laughs> just so that their product would reign supreme. Maybe they would even have giant murals or mosaics commissioned like the Gin Lane and Beer Street illustrations done by Hogarth to push the then British government's ideas about how gin is evil and bad. And, you know, there's like in that one, there's a mother literally who in the middle breastfeeding her child who's just going whoops and dropping the baby while drinking gin with the other hand and the uh, far more wonderful uh, beer over in Beer Street. Everybody's wonderful and marvelous and prosperous. And this certainly isn't, you know, a propaganda campaign <laughs> driven in part by business and morality. <laughs> so, okay, Oliver, how did this give you where Vo and Teravan meet? Well, it made me decide that they would meet somewhere that they are doing drugs instead of beer. And where are they doing drugs? Well, I don't want to give it away in the first sentence. I want it to be, to be like kind of a fun reveal maybe as they leave where they are or maybe partway through the scene. We'll see how that goes. But I want them to be in a temple of this religion, which is giving them, you know, sci-fi fantasy weed or coke. So I'm thinking they're in this kind of church-sponsored temple opium den thing when one of them looks across at the other, you know, both of them desperately trying to stay awake. It's already late at night and the drugs are helping with that, which leans us more towards the coke uh, than the fantasy weed. But yeah, neither of them really wants to go home to their respective uh, partners that they don't want to spend time with, but also can't bring themselves to end the relationship because of feelings of obligation. And so they are considering going heavier into the drug hole and part of that means giving themselves a bit more over to the church which they're not keen to do and would actually feel like they were kind of degrading themselves so i'm thinking maybe they get talking and they kind of tease out just enough of each other's situations you know not everything it'll be a while before either of them confesses to what's really going on with them but it's kind of like you know 
maybe we can free ourselves from this scene we're in and we can go find a speakeasy to have a drink in and be a little more upbeat than our solo drug binges we're currently having. Yes, yes. We start the story with them elevating each other in a smaller version of what they will be doing uh, when they really come together as pals at the end of the story. I like it. And certainly that, you know, the end of the story, you know, I figure the emotional climax is them exhausted beyond the power of drugs and booze to keep them going. You know, then maybe they confess their real reasons for not wanting to go back to their respective homes. They help free each other of their feelings of obligation to their partners, then flip a coin. Let's say the only one remaining from whatever they've stolen together and everything that's happened between the beginning and the end, uh, you know, a piece of treasure from the night's adventures to see who goes first each of the one being like just around the corner or just behind them, keeping them honest and on track for ending their unhealthy relationship. But then neither man is home. Both have realized that they aren't wanted or themselves felt trapped. And you'd think, you know, the thief who with Vo would have cleared Vo out, but actually it was Tiravam's fella who did it to them. <laughs> In an otherwise empty room, Vo and Tiravam then perhaps use uh, bags of coins as pillows, passing out finally, fully trusting each other in a mirror of Vo and Krog the Thief from my very first story in this whole damn project, uh, debating, you know, who should sleep first at the end of that story. You know, here there is no debate. They trust each other, but a bum. Vo and a, a much more professional thief than her pass out, totally trusting each other. And I like the idea also that the bags of coin could be secret savings that Tiravam kept from her partner who cleaned her out, foreshadowing part of why Vo and Tiravam quote unquote break up later. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we have the ending. How does it start? Well, I kind of have that. I think I told you. But wherever escalating does it go? This is where I started to feel a little lost again. Actually, quite a bit lost, especially because events in my life were forcing me to do this outline over a much longer period of time than I had done any of the previous ones, which made it even harder to keep track of the fact that this thing had more stuff I was trying to establish up front than I think even the very first story of the whole novel. So, you know, I did some more general brainstorming. I kept going back to my list of things I wanted to establish and accomplish. And doing this did help me refine certain points and come up with the ideas for like moments. But it still didn't really give me the whole story. I was getting pieces of it, but I couldn't see it in my head. I couldn't see it. And it was oh, it was so frustrating. And then I remembered that I have written many screenplays and have been trained in such. And lo and behold, what do you do with screenplays? You bust out the index cards. Well, I and many others do. I mean, I have a good friend who's uh, got a quite the career going in screenwriting, and she prefers to just do like a bullet point list and a word file that she can push up and down. But yeah, I and many others really enjoy the physicality of having index cards on a cork board that you can write on and move around. Other people like to do a virtual version of that in Final Draft or Scrivener or wherever. I'd never really considered doing this with a novel. Uh, so my previous two books, didn't touch them, didn't touch index cards. And I hadn't even done them with uh, the other short stories I've written so far. But here I just I really had that need to be able to kind of see all the elements in front of me at once and writing them over and over and over again in my notebook was actually starting to not really work and be annoying. And I even copied a whole bunch of stuff out onto like a bigger piece of paper. And then I was like, what am I doing? I, I index cards, of course, especially because then I can move the elements around a lot easier. And with a short story, which is what this is, right? Short story cycle. It's a story within a, a collection of them making up the whole novel. I could get my head around using index cards for that. Somewhat arbitrarily, I chose eight cards. I used those to plot out the story. And I'll get into those in a second because what I did before I even did that was I grabbed what wound up being four cards to try and get down the real point form basics of all this stuff that I wanted to put in. So the first card, which I used a colored five by seven, by the way, I used bigger, pardon me, four by six. Uh, I used bigger index cards. The standard size is three and a half for this kind of thing, but I figured I'd give myself more room. I used a blue colored one for like my absolute lighthouse for this thing to guide me, covering the absolute basics of how this is a story of blah. Vo is living for Vo. Uh, she is now living a kind of stasis life as opposed to seeking resolution as she was before. You know, blah, blah. What's the trajectory? What's the perspective? What's the kind of tone I'm aiming for? Right. OK, cool. Then I had another card that just literally said to establish and a list bullet point real tight of just things I wanted to establish and introduce. Then I had bound to each other. Uh, thinking of the old Kanye West song bound to I wrote it that way. Uh, yeah, my list of ways I wanted them to become bonded in the story. And then just another one where I put book two first story and a whole bunch more stuff I wanted to establish and get across and things of tone and theme and so on because I needed a second card for that. So those four cards, I laid them out left to right. And then above them, I put the 
eight cards that I had chosen to use for outlining the actual plot. Then I put in big letters along the tops of each of the index cards for the plot, roughly the location or what is happening. So like we open with the temple was the first one, the second one getting to know you, walk and talk, and so on and so forth, until at the very end I put crashing at Tiravams because I figured it would be at their apartment where they would ultimately fall asleep. At the start I was able to put that kind of heading on six out of the eight cards using stuff I'd imagined as I was working my way up to this point. And then I just put the gaps, the two empty fellows, where it kind of felt like I'm going to need more or I'm going to need some space between what's in front and behind them. And it's here that really the outlining happened as I took stuff from those four cards that I put, you know, the bullet point of like everything I want in the story on them and rewrote elements from any one of those cards onto any one of the eight plot cards. So, you know, I would have an idea of, OK, well, that's where that goes and that's where this goes and OK and so on and so forth. And oftentimes as I'd be copying them over onto the plot cards. I would come up with, if I hadn't already, how that element would be expressed, introduced, shown, told, whatever. This process would occasionally be interrupted by me realizing that I needed to figure out something in detail for which there wasn't really room to do so on any one index card, and so I would go back to my notebook and be like, okay, so the part where they actually have a heist that gets the attention of a big villain that chases them for the rest of the story... What is that heist? What does that entail? Okay, and I'd write that out on a page and then I'd go, okay, and I'd come back to the index card and put like the absolute main points on the card from what I had written in the notebook. And it was just a lot of this for a little while, back and forth, back and forth, until I felt I had everything filled out enough that I could, if I needed to sit down, you know, someone put a gun to my head and said, stop your work. Now write the damn thing. I could. Will I have more to fill in in the outlining section? Probably, but as has been the case with all of these outlines I've been sharing with you, I get them done enough. I get them like 90, 95% whatever done, knowing that when it's time to actually write them, I will go back and reread the whole damn outline, come up with stuff to fill in the gaps, come up with new ways of expressing stuff that's already there. Like it's going to change again before I sit down to really write it. And it's going to change again as I write it and again as I edit it and again as somebody else looks at it and gives me notes on it and I edit it again and so on and so forth, right? So this is where like the folly I think of having every little thing worked out before you put down a single sentence it's just that, Polly. Okay, so I'm just going to run you through the basic shape of this as I found it in my index cards, and then a little bit of some leftover stuff, including something I almost always do at the beginning, and I wound up doing it right at the end with this story, followed by the first listener question in quite some time, which I'm very excited to answer. Right, so we start in the temple, which we maybe don't reveal as a temple right away. It's definitely looking more like a drug den, which it basically is, where we have Vo or Tiravem looking up, you know, kind of crack-eyed and just like, Ugh, and they see the other one and they look kind of the same. And then one of them says something like, they'll give us more, but you know what they'll make us do? And this quickly leads to having us start the story by having them uplift each other. You know, we shouldn't degrade ourselves for drugs with religion. We should steal them or go get a beer. Don't say that too loud. We're in the church of people who think alcohol is forbidden and have convinced the rulership of this city to enforce that. Hmm. In fact, this is an added benefit of me making alcohol a no bueno in this city is it makes it a real like act of trust to ask someone like, do you know where to find some? And so we also get a little act of trust at the very beginning of them knowing each other. On to card number two, which I just wrote, getting to know you walk and talk. If I can, I'd really like to hold out on the reveal that they're in a temple, a place of religion, uh, until they step out of it. And a fun little world building detail that I would like to have is to have that door set in the bottom of a tremendously large mural, mosaic, whatever, of essentially their version of, you know, cocaine street and alcohol alley. I do think I want the drug that they're on to be something along the lines of cocaine, but if only because I want this story to be escalating madness and cocaine lends itself to that way more than weed. So yeah, Vo and Tiravem are walking and talking as they go to where Tiravem claims they can find them a speakeasy to get drunken. I figure they're two people who are young, you know, they're mid-twenties at this point who really want to already, you know, they're realizing I want to impress this person. I want to be cool for them. And so Tiravem, who is ashamed a little bit about being a thief, is coy about that. And so is Vo until one of them kind of slips and then they're like, oh, I can relax around you. We're both thieves. Cool, cool, cool. 
at which point they get more comfortable and you know the desire to impress each other starts to kick in a little more and this is where i can get in some more maybe surreptitious world building as they compare facts that they've gleaned in their month in this town and maybe teravam has been there a month and a week or a month and a day and tries to lean on that to be like a little cooler i'm only thinking of this now but i suspect subconsciously i was being influenced by one of my favorite films of all time kurosawa's the bad to sleep well which has a masterpiece exposition dump right at the beginning where there's a whole bunch of journalists outside of like a huge corporate wedding which is like a big deal and they are competitively sharing facts with each other and being like oh i think that guy's this guy and this guy's that guy and he's gonna go to jail and she's gonna do that and it's just a great way of setting up the world with kind of an energy and a rhythm and also the fact that maybe somebody's wrong about one of the facts they're giving out and it leaves a little bit of wiggle room for the writer and also a little bit of wiggle room for the imagination of the viewer or reader but it's not all competitive sharing of knowledge i also like the idea of getting across that thing i mentioned earlier of how vo and tiravam are surprised at how the company of the other makes them want to actually be nicer and better than they would normally and my little note here for that is i like the idea of Vo saying you know i did my makeup myself it's terrible it's really gaudy and wild and out there and tiravam coming from sort of a more catty you know noble background is surprised that they don't actually want to make a catty cutting you know remark or like a little subtle remark that the person might not get but it's an insult on to card three of eight the speakeasy which i went through a lot of ideas about what it could be disguised as and in the end i settled on a puppet theater like obviously not the small little punch and judy booth <laughs> kind of thing but like a big proper theater with maybe almost human-sized puppets i've done some googling about west african puppetry and found some interesting stuff i'll probably weave in here but it will be partly its own thing again i'm not interested in making a place that is a one-to-one -one for anywhere even if lagos nigeria and the benin kingdom are kind of on my mind while i'm doing this Oh, and as soon as puppets show up in a story, mine or someone else's, my obvious metaphor alarm starts clanging really loudly. So I made a note on the card here, you know, like, let's be wary of any crap about like, oh, you got to cut your strings to the boyfriend you don't want to have anymore or whatever. What was that voice? Where did it come from? Let's move on. <laughs> So, you know, I have a bunch of notes on this card here of various peoples that I could and characters I could set up even for later stories that are seen in part or in force or whatever at the speakeasy, which maybe you're led through the theater, through the back of the theater, and then the behind there through a secret door, voila, you get a secret bar. And along that walk, as they're led through by a bouncer, they manage to convince that they're okay, you know, uh, they see what is kind of an interesting thing for Vo in particular, who is the more impetuous of the two at this point. Vo sees where they store the puppets, which as I say, some of them I'm seeing being quite large, and so the storage boxes are at least the size of a shoebox, and many of them quite a bit larger, and she's intrigued by this. But yeah, swats that, and then on they go into the bar. So yeah, in the bar we have a little more fun, we get in the drinking culture, the secret drinking culture. We of course have some police or whatever, you know, town guard militia there, because naturally they protect this industry as much as they prey upon it and participate in it. Vo and Tiravam chat about this, that, and the other thing, taking turns ogling people, then saying how great their partners are. No, really. So my variation on the Ilmet and Langmar thing, where Fafran and Grey Mouser want each of their respective partners to like their respective new buddy, here Vo and Tiravam are still kind of like they want to impress each other, but they're also kind of feeling eh about their partners that they've got back home that they really don't want to see. And so there's a bit of flimflamery here with that, which I really like. What'll kick things up a notch is when Vo, having spotted those, you know, big puppet storage boxes earlier and is, you know, she's new to this place. So she's looking at it with a different eye than Teravan, who's kind of like, yeah, check out this cool place I know about. Vo is like, hey, you know, I'm kind of looking at when people buy drinks, when I buy drinks and where money goes. And I don't think they store the money in this bar. And I think I know where they might store it. And what if we robbed this place? You know, maybe it's like she spots a turnover of like, you know, the bar has too much cash behind it. And so some big muscly people come through and are like, well, give us the cash box. And here's a new middle of the empty one, just enough in it for change. And Vo realizes the cash boxes look really similar to the puppet boxes. Excited by this wild idea and wanting to impress her new friend, Tara Vam's like, sure, let's do that. But how? Now, the comedian in me wants to have it be like, Voa, you know, is like, I, I have a cunning plan. And then just like picks up a, one of the bigger, heavier puppets and knocks out the guard back in the puppet theater. <laughs> um, I, I may go for something more fancy, but th that's what I have for now. I've got a lot of research to do on medieval and late antiquity kind of era thievery techniques. 
So yeah, they deal with that guard and the bouncer, presumably, who leads people back through and any other security stuff they have to deal with and get a couple of big boxes of gold, hurrah, and are charging out of the place when perhaps they run into a major villain that I definitely want to have in this story and may carry through into other stories the way that the Thieves Guild became a recurring, usually villainous faction in the Lankmar stories. For now, I'll just say imagine a kind of medievalish mob boss character with an unusual physical appearance and manner, perhaps even you know the rare villain who actually feels shame over what he does and covers it with a veneer of erudite speech and quoting historical people and so on and so forth. And I kind of like the idea of him coming in to check in on one of his many speakeasies just as Bo and Teravam are on their way out. And you can have that kind of classic, don't you know who I am? You know, like his reputation is half the security for this place. And Bo's like, nope, got here a month ago. Conk hits him on the head or whatever. I can't get here and do that. Uh, and they run off having successfully angered a very powerful, very dangerous man. And I want him to not even be remotely the last person that they irritate to the point of murderousness on this night. In fact, I may backfill, though, picking the pockets and otherwise being a nuisance to other people in the bar before deciding to rob the joint. You know, one of the things I want to have in this story is that though, as she gets away with more, she wants to get away with even more, which, as you can imagine, feeds into the escalation of this whole thing. Okay, we're halfway through. On to card number five of eight, which I just put, enjoying the thrill of getting away with it, bracket for now, and bracket. So yeah, whether or not we have maybe a brief chase scene or whatever, the point is that Bo and Tiravam literally get away with their ill-gotten goods. And they're kind of high on the thrill of what they've just pulled off together and the thrill that they did it with someone they only met recently, like a couple hours ago, and they're really feeling the friendship getting stronger, you know, bonded through this experience, right? And normally they would probably be like, okay, let's split the loot and I'll see you later maybe, but they really want to just keep staying up later because they really don't want to go home to see those partners that they really don't want to see. So they keep pushing their luck and maybe do a little more coke. <laughs> And maybe the truth starts to leak out a little bit. Like, you know, I love my partner. I just don't want to go home yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. That's I also love my partner and just simply do not wish to go home yet because I'm having so much fun. And so we have a very quick scene where they decide, hey, you know what? Uh, this neighborhood we're in has a couple of shops or homes, maybe, you know, whatever. Places worth robbing. What if we take turns robbing that place and this other place and, you know, one time Vo does the theft while Tiravim watches and, you know, keeps an eye out for guards or whatever. And then we do vice versa. Tiravim pulls off the theft at the other joint and Vo keeps an eye on them while they, you know, do that. And then they're so high and out of it that they both go individually to do their thefts, assuming the other one is watching over them when nobody's watching over anybody and the two thefts are happening simultaneously. So the way I'll tell it in the story, you know, I'll make them each individually look cool while pulling off thieving stuff because I want them to be competent. They're not clowns, but they are swashbuckling people who sometimes make fools of themselves, which is what they realize they've done when they both come back to like the meeting place and are like, wait a minute, you weren't watching for the guard at my place? And the other day, I know you weren't watching for the guard at my place. Oh, dear. And then they realize they are both being chased by people from the respective places they just robbed. Which gets us to card number six of eight, which I just titled, They Found Us. Who? Everybody! Because as they get all this attention from the guards of the two places that they just robbed, or guards, owners, whatever, who cares, uh, people who are mad that they've been victimized by Bo and Tervim, then I'd like to think that the big mob boss and his goons will have also caught up with them, and maybe anybody else they pissed off at the bar or even the temple earlier. This would certainly be where their motivation, Bo and Teravim, flips from curiosity to survival as this mob builds and chases them up, I'm thinking, onto rooftops. We have a little bit of just fun chase beats and violence, which can get across the whole thing of like Vo's greater comfort with it and Teravim's different opinion, which I see being grounded in practicality as much as morality. You know, I've got a little line here that's presumably Teravim talking to Vo, you know, saying, you you don't know what family they have who might come for you later which is the great kind of dangling thread i can follow up on later in this story or in another story or never haha -ha! a writer's trick so yeah rooftop chase 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 fight 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 until finally they get cornered on a rooftop where there's really nowhere else to go and one by one all these people who want to beat the hell out of them or maybe even kill them are coming at them Bo and two of them have their backs against a you know, sharp drop or maybe even like the wall of like a higher section of another building that they can't quite climb or whatever. And they look 
Like they're doomed. But then one more person gets on the roof and all but the section that Vo and Tira Vem are standing on collapses, dumping all of the people who want to get them like down a very, from this say it's a very high ceiling, you know, far enough down that they all kind of go and are badly injured, maybe even killed. And they may come after them in future adventures, but for now, Vo and Tira Vem are safe. And I really like the idea that in this climax is established, you know, Vo says to Tira Vem maybe, you know, if we'd angered even one less person tonight, we'd have been killed. And I've got no shame. When I came up with that line uh, while I was working at the Merrill Collection in silence, I let out a, you know, a laugh that was loud enough to get a look from one or two other people. Fair enough. And so it's there in card seven of eight that we have the climax, which leads to the sort of cathartic release as they're able to then slink away with whatever treasure they still have their hands on. I would like them to lose practically all of it in the course of their escape from the goons and whatnot. And with the adrenaline and everything else finally wearing off, they confess what they, you know, why they really don't want to go home. And because it's basically always easier to give sound advice to someone else about their problem, they each are able to help the other one out, which brings us to the final card, Crashing at Tiravams. I like to think they start by going to Vo's place to find out that the thief is like, yeah, I wanted to leave too, uh, bye. Uh, and then they go back to Tiravams to you know, talk to the lower caste person who Tiravam has decided is a very noble person because of their caste, not unlike awful nobles of which she is from and would like to separate herself from. But actually the noble working class, uh, slave caste, whatever guy, has cleaned her out and the apartment barely has a stick of furniture in it. So we have kind of the gentle wind down where Tiravan reveals, well, at least I kept, uh, you know, two sacks of coins <laughs> hidden under the floorboards where the cast member didn't know about it, which tells us something about Tiravan's character. And as I say, that will pay off at the end of the act. Well, this half of act two, which is the exact midpoint of the novel. And here I have a whole bunch of little notes about exactly how this will go down and lines that they might say to each other. I like the idea of O saying, you know, maybe you could write plays about our adventures, you know. Uh, maybe, you know, even says it seems wise to make sure a bond exists on both sides, you know, in terms of the relationships that they were both in where they, it turns out they were the only ones who were really invested in them. So also here, it's the reason for them to really like, you know, overtly be like, so are we friends? <laughs> are we friends and business partners now? Just want to make sure because of the whole relationship thing that just happened. Oh, and I kind of like the idea that, you know, as they're falling, falling asleep, Vo suggesting, you know, maybe you should write plays about our adventures. Tiravam could respond, let's live them first. That feels like a fun closing line for this, I think, as well as before that, we'll do the whole, you know, who keeps watch first thing and them agreeing that neither of them needs to because the place they're in is relatively safe and they trust each other, unlike the whole Vo and Krog thing from the very first story. Yes. So, yeah, in a nutshell, that's Kinship in Coltoom, which I realized I think I was saying Cartoom earlier in this recording. Gosh darn it. Well, that just tells you how new the name is. I obviously still need to get used to it. <laughs> Sure, there are some gaps and details to fill, and I have already done some work on that. Things like, you know, who exactly do I want to have in the speakeasy, the name and appearance of the mob boss type guy, the specifics of the other two places they rob and the methods they use, the precise list of parties chasing them, and me figuring out how I can, without stretching credulity, work in as many people as possible to be mad at them. And then like setting details like what kind of food do they have at the bar, you know, what's their clothing like, that kind of stuff. It was at this point I felt like I just about crossed the finish line when I realized, holy cow, what is the theme or thematic statement of this story, this thing that I usually try and work out? pretty much right at the start and then have it influence all of my choices that come after. Holy cow, I haven't figured that out. So I sat down and was like, oh, I guess I can figure this out afterwards. And it is true. I have often read people say that like they don't go in with a theme or a thematic statement in mind. They instead try and discover what it is by looking back at the story once they've got it basically outlined and then they can you know tweak it accordingly. So I looked at stuff that I'd written down for the act as a whole, and I was like, well, I do want to establish that friendship and loyalty are the moral core of these stories. And this is the story of a friendship for me between two people who each need to cut themselves loose from their partners. Uh, they feel obligated in a way they're assu they've assumed they are and cling on due to uh, anxiety, uh, not genuine want. Meanwhile, we have the church prohibition uh, and the it's technically illegal, but you know thing going on with the speakeasies. And our, our two head characters are both finding freedom in the city. Maybe it can be about loyalty to people, pals in particular, over organizations and bonds that exist only in the head of one party. So communication, I underlined, and honesty, I underlined, along with loyalty and friendship. So yeah, simple enough thematic statement. Loyal, honest friendship is the most important thing. 
And maybe I said that in a way that sounded a little corny, but you know what? I believe in it. I really do. And that's it. The last thing I did was what I like to do to check myself at the end of these outlines, which is to make lists of like, you know, the uh, story beats that are not conflict uh, from the Ursula K. Le Guin in the craft book there, you know, relating, finding, losing, bearing, discovering, parting and changing. Do I have any of these in my story? Do I want any of these in my story that are not already there? You know, the uh, types of conflict thing I ripped from script notes there, contrary opinions, struggle against circumstances, internal conflict, avoiding a negative outcome, lack of info or dilemma. You know, do I have these in my story? Do I want ones in my story that are not already present? And finally, 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 my sort of sword and sorcery checklist, uh, which you may recall from the very first episode of this podcast, the Brian Murphy seven point definition. I want to make sure I have at least enough of those seven points to feel confident this this feels like a sword and sorcery story because that's what I'm going for, right? You know, it doesn't have dark and dangerous magic, personal and or mercenary motivations for the protagonists, horror or Lovecraftian horror even influences. Is it a short episodic story? Is it inspired in parts by history? And does it feature, you know, outsider hero or heroes? As ever, I look to these lists as a kind of way of like checking myself and, you know, using them as like writing prompts, not as a Mad Libs form I have to fill out every single line on. Then I just left myself like a page and a half for any additional thoughts that might pop into my head about the specific story, a lot of which came up not too long after I did that, so I'm glad I left that space. And voila, I was finished. I was finished. Not my novel. <laughs> That'd be nice. I was finished the denim notebook, the moleskin denim notebook, in which I've been doing all of my outlining since deciding to expand this project from a short story into a novel. There was just a little space at right at the end, right before my index, where I decided to write a project diary entry. So here's how I was feeling about this project when I wrote that entry at the end of this notebook on October 16th, 2021. It reads as follows. So about 20 months from starting this notebook, I'm roughly 27%, let's say, into outlining the novel, if you go by the amount of stories outlined. However, there was a lot of other stuff to figure out in order to do those story outlines. Plus, arguably, the novel was a real backburner project for about a year from June 20th to June, uh, probably June 2020 to June 2021. Between that, all the other things I've written in this window and launching the podcasts and Patreon, which only seems to be improving in quality and how it benefits the novel. Well, also, 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 uh, all but one month has been during the pandemic. So... So I feel good about what I've done. It's also safe to say I'm excited to take this through to a publication draft. I don't worry about losing interest or otherwise not finishing. I'm in way too deep for that. I am concerned that this not being contemporary, epic, or high fantasy, or the first in a planned trilogy means I'll be wasting my time pursuing traditional publishing. But... My fingers are crossed with the hope that the audience I build with the podcast and the network I'm building through my interviews and so on may help me find and convince the right agent or publisher. Of course, I have to also write the best book I can. So, OK, as I'm so fond of saying on this podcast, let's get on with it. All right. It's time for a listener question sent in from Mike H. Hi, Oliver. Question for you. Do you think that sword and sorcery has to be bound to a particular time or place and setting? Could you place something in the 18th century, for instance, and still have it recognizable as sword and sorcery? Thanks for the question, Michael. It's an interesting one, I gotta admit. You know, in Brian Murphy's seven-point definition of sword and sorcery, my personal favorite, there's no real mention of era. When I look over at another great sort of breakdown of what is sword and sorcery, written by Howard Andrew Jones over on the Goodman Games blog. One bullet point reads, The environment. Sword and sorcery fiction takes place in lands different from our own, where technology is relatively primitive, allowing the protagonists to overcome their martial obstacles face to face. Magic works, but seldom at the best of the heroes. More often sorcery is just one more obstacle used against them, and is usually wielded by villains or monsters. The landscape is exotic, either a different world or far corners of our own. Now, this can get fuzzy, right? You can't always map one-to-one -one, like a classic story to an era of our own history. I mean, Conan theoretically takes place in our incredibly distant past, one that's been largely forgotten except in these fantastic tales you're reading, and its technology level kind of mimics, you know, it sort of varies. It can be like Iron Age, or even Bronze Age in some really dark corners of it. Uh, all the way through to sometimes I remember at least one story in Aquilonia, the country which Conan eventually becomes king of, featuring like heavy cavalry with plate mail, which is a far further ahead era than, you know, say late antiquity or whatever. 
Then you have the equally classic Jarelle of Jury stories by C.L. Moore, which take place in medieval France. I think one story says something about it being maybe like the 14th century, and nobody would dispute that those are sword and sorcery stories. Coming back to Howard's definition, he does mention technology being relatively primitive, though depending on your point of view, I think most people would consider any technology handed to them from before the Victorian era to be rather primitive. And then there's what Howard says about facing your foe face to face. Well, certainly by the time you get to the point of guns being the dominant weapon in warfare, I mean, face to face is a relative term here, but I think maybe what Howard's getting at is something a bit closer and more visceral than two people firing rifles at each other from across a field. For now, I think we'll leave aside sort of standard storytelling conventions regarding duels in, say, westerns. Though I gotta say, a sword and sorcery western is a tagline that gets my attention. But at the end of the day, you're asking me what I think. I think setting and technology really do matter for defining whether or not something is sword and sorcery, or a subgenre of sword and sorcery, or something else entirely. I've done my episode on Sword and Planet that you may have listened to, where you put someone on another planet, and there's aliens, and maybe some high technology mixed in with the swords, and the horses that are being ridden around on, or the horse-like alien thingies. And yeah, that makes it Sword and Planet. It does change it. Other times you might have people have high technology show up in a sword and sorcery story, almost like an intrusion. I'm thinking of Carla Gru Wagner's Kane novels, and I won't spoil which and where, but in more than one of them, weird super science basically shows up. Does that mean it's no longer sword and sorcery? I don't think so, because it's a sword and sorcery world having a bizarre intrusion that is essentially equated with magic. It's just some other kind of weird magic. And humans don't master it, they don't mass produce it, and they're not using it against each other in like standard bar brawls and warfare and so on. But it's not just about tools of warfare, in my opinion. If you were to take Conan the Barbarian and airdrop him and uh, maybe an evil wizard he's fighting into the middle of 1930s Los Angeles, I would wonder where that story's going, but I don't think I would call it sword and sorcery. And if there were enough stories like that, I might wonder if it's time to come up with a new subgenre, because that's what it would feel like to me. It'd be drawing elements from sword and sorcery and mixing them in with something else, I figure, to me, that's a subgenre like Sword and Planet. So as with so many things, you wind up with where you want to have a definitive answer, and I would love to give it to you, but I think it's like a spectrum kind of situation where we know there's a point moving along the history of mankind and equivalence of it over in a secondary world, right? Where we're like, yeah, that's Sword and Sorcery, no question about it. It feels right. It feels suitably primitive. And then on the other end, there's definitely a point at which I don't think anybody would say, yeah, it's sword and sorcery because, yeah, like I say, dropping Conan into the 30s or even earlier, like I say, anywhere in the Industrial Revolution, I don't know how you would make that feel like a straight sword and sorcery story. Unless perhaps it was involving like one of those uh, tribes of people in Papua New Guinea or the Amazon who are completely removed from the modern world, in which case the fact that it's in the modern world is irrelevant beyond perhaps some amusement uh, if the narrator relates this to the reader. So uh, what do you call that, right? And then in between the point where it obviously is acceptable as sword and sorcery to 99% of humans who care about these things, and the other end where it is obviously not straight to sword and sorcery, at least, to 99% of humans who see this and care about this, you have the fuzzy area. What's the fuzzy area in the middle? Well, it all comes down to personal taste and aesthetics, I would argue. I personally think that as soon as you get guns in the mix, it just kind of stops feeling like sword and sorcery and starts edging towards something else. That's me. Though again, my mind comes back to the Western and I think about stories told from the perspectives of the indigenous North Americans fighting back against the quote-unquote civilization of the white man and think, well, you know, civilization versus quote-unquote barbarism is a big theme in sword and sorcery. Hmm. But I think my tastes run to believing that as soon as we're on the cusp of mass-produced guns and industry and all that stuff, it's over, baby. Maybe you could set a story really close to that, where you could have this kind of melancholy running underneath the tale about this being like the last time there can even be a sword and sorcery story. This is the last sword and sorcery adventure before the world moves on from the kind of place where those things can happen. Maybe. And this now makes me think of Joe Abercrombie's most recent trilogy, which he doesn't claim to write sword and sorcery. His whole thing is grimdark. That's a whole other conversation. But it is about essentially a transition from a magical world to an industrialized world. And so 
you might want to check that out. Maybe even read the preceding trilogy, the first Law trilogy, which I myself recently read. And you could even read in between those two trilogies his book, The Heroes, which is all about one big battle. And I read that, rather enjoyed it. It definitely has signs of industry a coming, of guns and cannons and so on, basically being here, but they haven't worked out all the kinks yet. Seven books is a hearty reading assignment, but you could start at the beginning of First Law and just keep going until you reach the point where you think, you know, this doesn't feel like sword and sorcery could happen in this world, even if it's not strictly a sword and sorcery setting. This is my line. This is what feels like where I would stop in moving my stories forward in human history or the equivalent of it. All right, I hope that was helpful, and thanks again for your question. I really appreciate it when people send them in. I love answering them. I hope you have all enjoyed this episode, and next time I'll be joining you with an outline of my... Well, <laughs> let's just say the holding title for the story is Furta Sacra. Anybody who feels like looking at that Latin or just giving a Google to horse around could guess at the subject matter of the story. So I'm Writing a Novel features original music by Gloria Guns and is hosted by yours truly, Oliver Brackenbury. If you'd like to submit a question, then please email it to so I'm writing a novel at gmail.com. Bonus points if you record yourself and send me an MP3 I can cut into the show. Doesn't have to be fancy. Using your phone is fine. Just keep it clear and concise. You can also holler at the show on Twitter. Look for at so underscore writing, at so writing. Please consider sharing the show with anybody who might like it, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, and checking out patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel. Patrons get to be thanked in the final novel, listen to episodes of the podcast a week early, and even enjoy a bonus podcast called So I Wrote a Novel, where I read and comment on chapters of previous works, starting with my first novel, Junkyard Leopard. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I'll see you soon.